Hi and welcome to another episode of A Workflow 201 series. My name is Nathan Pierce. That's me in the racing car. Today we're going to talk about developing iApps for iWorkflow. Three areas today. Quick background on iApps and how we got where we are. What it requires to develop them specifically for iWorkflow. There's some additional functionality in there we need to share. And then some next steps. How to um, take that information and make it useful. So, quick background on iApps. We released them way back in 2011. Um, they were to solve, uh, developed to solve the human problem with deployment guides, and I'll uh, give a bit of an overview of what I mean by that. Um, we started developing these way back in 2002, these awesome deployment guides. We sat down with our partners like Microsoft, etc., cetera, um, did all the hard work of of coming up with every setting to make uh, applications fast, available, and secure. The problem is, look at the amount of pages. Exchange, there's 119. We've got Citrix, ZenApp, and Zen Desktop uh, deployment guide is 68. And the issue our customers were having, actually, is that a lot of the room for error is at the keyboard of implementing these deployment guides. Some of them could take up to a week to enter all of those settings. So. We came up with iApps, the templatization of those deployment guides, and they've been evolving since 2002 when we wrote the first one. Um, and more recently, iApps have made their way onto iWorkflow. So iWorkflow is a REST API driven solution for presenting a services catalog, and that catalog is iApps. That's covered in other episodes. Today, we're just going to talk about what it takes to write an iApp for iWorkflow. Originally, iApps were made to be run as a GUI wizard type interface for um, F5's application delivery controllers, big IP. But um, running through iWorkflow, it's very much REST oriented. You can use them through the iWorkflow GUI, but um, uh, we we focus mainly on, on REST I control REST solutions that helps us integrate into third-party technologies, etc. So apps for iWorkflow. Three things we need to talk about today. So there's the iApp versions. Um, we need to talk about the fact that these are new things added since we were writing iApps for um, big IP. So back in 2011, the original scope was to have them run in the GUI. Now we've got this other environment, this platform that's far more extensible. So we've had to add in certain versioning support. And I'm going to talk about that and what that looks like. But there's two types of versioning, as you see at the bottom. There's the IAP version itself, and then the version of big IP that that IAP supports. Okay, so. First, the version of the iApp itself. Now we actually pluck that out of the template's name. So you'll see at the top here, what we require is a format. You'll see v.1.0.0 in the name dots uh, or underscores. I'm using dots because I just like them more. So and originally just been called, you'll see down the bottom here. Ooh, let's use the pen. This could be fun. My template name that could be what you've been using before for your homegrown iApp that you built yourself what you're going to have to do is specify a version number in addition to that inside the template it references itself it does like to talk about itself um you're going to need to do it like a search it's not just the beginning there may be other references you want to do a search inside the template for the template's name and then make sure that that also references the version wherever that name is placed so this helps i workflow um, understand which version of the template because obviously you might iterate the template and add new features or change the way that it behaves or, or interacts with other services so it's really important to be able to add this versioning instead of just a flat name that you're then stuck with how do you know if it got upgraded on box a versus box b so this was kind of demanded by our uh, customer base that we support versioning and it's pretty cool. We've been using it a bit ourselves. Prior to iWorkflow 2.0, you didn't have to have it. iWorkflow 2.0 and onwards, you're going to need to put it in there for iWorkflow to acknowledge your work. Okay. The next thing is big IP versioning. So we added a 
functionality in iWorkflow 210 where you can specify, let's have some fun with that wonderful pen again, you can specify the minimum supported big IP version, maximum supported, and even a list of the ones that are unsupported. So it will not let your iWorkflow tenant deploy this template to a version that you have not deemed tested and signed off and sanctions. Maybe you just really didn't like the sound of 11.6.1. Well, let me show you in the next slide. You can specifically say, I'm gonna use the pen, I'm gonna use the arrow now. That doesn't work very well. Let me down, let's go back to the pen. You could say, don't use 11.6.1. So here's an example. So these attributes you specify, you know, the minimum version that I've tested my app, the maximum version, so it won't allow you to install it on 12.1.2 or even 13 if you were to use this setting. So there's two different types of versioning we just covered. There's the version of the app itself, then there's the versions of the big IPs that your app will be supported on. Uh, you'll see the little square brackets here. It's because you can put multiple entries in. It's an array. They're quite fun as well. Moving on. Oh, now we got arrows. So here's what it looks like in the GUI. You'll see, look at that version number inside my iApp there, and then there's a version number here. Look at that, see? Because this is a supported iApp for iWorkflow 210 and beyond. Uh, we got the version number there, the version number reference inside the iApp. Now down here is the supported big IP version information. So this is where I'd have my minimum, which could be 11.5. Four. Um, this could be my maximum. So I think 12.1.1 was what we used in the previous example. Could be anything else. And then here is a list of unsupported. Now these are optional. These versions, I you could leave them empty and still save, and that would work fine. What is not optional though is the iApp version itself. You need to provide that version. You know what? If you're not a big fan of versions and that's not how you roll, that's fine. You could call them all v1.0.0 but you do have to put the version in there. That is how we roll. What does it look like via REST? So I, I did go on about this being a REST-oriented uh, product. The GUI itself is a client of the REST API and I workflow, in fact. Little fun fact for you there. So this is what it looks like if you do it via REST. So if you're installing an IAP template, I have cut this down for simplicity because um, you'll notice well, these two bits here are really short because I needed to fit it in the screen. They are normally the contents of the iApp. The important bit here though is, look, we've got version there and then you would be specifying these when you paste that iApp template into a REST-based tool. Maybe you're using Postman to install this onto your iWorkflow platform. So that's what it looks like via the REST interface. Lastly, we're going to move on to something else, which is the application tier. Now, if you hadn't seen this before in iWorkflow, fear not, it was always there. We were actually just filling some of it out for you. And I'll show you what I mean. This is the application tier down the bottom. And you'll see some fields in here. You give it a name and you got to tell it what these things map to. So why is this important? Why do we want to use it? Well, there's two main things, the presentation of the template. So what if a developer had used this to store the VIP address when they were creating the template? We don't wanna hand that over to the team who might be doing deployments and are not really big on all of our terminology from within the NetOps team where we created these templates. Well, what we do in iWorkflow is we map our crazy weird name through to virtual address so i'm just going to go back a screen virtual address here we would select out from a list of um attributes names that iWorkflow found in the template and we'd say okay whenever you see this one we're actually meaning virtual address and that makes it really easy to present that to a user a, a, a someone who wasn't part of the iApp development team and doesn't have that level of expertise the second important thing is the statistics collection and presentation engine that we built into iWorkflow. Well, it doesn't know that you've created this bizarrely long name up the top here for your iApps. It knows to query whatever the virtual address is. So if we do this mapping, then the stats engine just has to say, 
hey, give me whatever the virtual address is mapped to for this template, which is this guy, and it will be able to bridge that gap and work out, okay, for if I'm getting stats for the VIT, what I'm actually going to talk to is this thing over here. So that's pretty important. Both of those things are important. So this is what the application tier um, is all about. Now, you might be thinking, but I've never seen this before and I've been using my workflow. So these next couple of screenshots are actually using iWorkflow 2.0, which is a couple of versions back now. I think we had one, two, three, four, four versions, maybe five. Um, the reason you might not have seen it is because we did something kind of neat for people to, to onboard easily. What we did is we took a list of iApps that were shipping with the big IP that we knew a lot about. We already knew what the attribute names were inside the product. And this is that list here. So when... What we did is we made it so that when you were selecting accept defaults or common options, we were able to pre-populate the application tier and the defaults for you. So we auto mapped that and you'll see what I mean. So right now we've got accept defaults selected and you get presented with this list. And you'll notice when you get presented with this list, you set accept defaults. So there are no options down here to edit when I grabbed f5.http. f5.http was one of those common ones that was installed on Big IP. We knew already what the names were gonna be. So we did that bit for you. Equally, um, if you selected common options, well, you'll see the same list here for the app um, templates. So that's this list here is the same. But now we're exposing what the defaults were. So common options that you might want to do. So in the previous one with accept defaults, they were filled up for you. But I might want to come here and say, you know what? The um, default address that the listener's on is not going to be 80. Or maybe I want to tick this box and say, you know what? The tenant can choose what the port's going to be at the time of deployment. However, you'll notice I still don't see an app tiers because we were pre-populating that. However, if you go to the third option now, all options. Okay, now we're going to show all of the iApps that we discovered off of that big IP because pre-version 2.1, we discovered them from the big IP. Post 2.1 and moving forward, we don't discover them on the big IP. You install them directly to iWorkflow. So that's a key differentiator. So this is on my 2.0 box. So it used to discover everything that I installed on my big IP. So I had quite a lot of them. Now we didn't have all of the information for accepting defaults or for specifying the application tier for all of these. So now we're just saying, you know, show us everything that's on there. Um, now iWorkflow, yeah, doesn't hold the default settings, does not hold the application tier settings. So if I select F5 HTTP, which we've been using thus far, now I'm getting all of the app tier. And you'll see, look, it actually already knew inside this template, it's gonna use pool address for that, that, that maps to the port. Then we've got the members. So it's telling it how to how to access the various parts of the underlying iApp in a way that's familiar to it. And then down here, we get all of the options as well. I cut it off so that it would fit on the screen. But I mean, you'll see literally there's six options for that module, there's 11 there. There's plenty of options. We have all of the options. So note that f5.http, like the third party iApps, is now showing that application tier information where it wasn't before. It's because we've said expose everything. So app tier was always there. Maybe you were just using accept defaults or common options. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not something we've just sort of snuck in to surprise you with. Now, the reason we've actually exposed it, um, so th these screenshots were from 2.0. Now from 2.1, it's going to be exposed for you to validate is because when we predetermined them, like we did before for those select few, I'm going to jump back a couple of slides. When we predefined them for you, well, that was kind of inhibitive. It, it took away some of the flexibility. I mean, we made it easier to get up and running for people new to iWorkflow, but it, it did kind of take a bit from, from what you could potentially do. So we've removed that and the application tier is going to be present from now on when you install iApps uh, onto the box. So you're going to see this lower section. Next steps. What do you do with all this information? Well, I'm going to provide a couple of links. This is a video. So if you're trying to click those links right now, you're probably having a little bit of trouble. I'm going to provide links to these in the article that I will embed this video into. 
um, I'm going to provide you a link to learn a little bit more about template naming. So the version that goes in the template name, that's the first link. The second link is a little bit of information about specifying the big IP versions that your template will support. The third one, app tier, well, I'm not going to provide a link because basically the app tier is about mapping uh, the, the names, virtual server, virtual port, pool members, etc., to whatever the iApp developer decided to put in there. Now, you'll see the documentation for the app services underscore integration iApp, which is developed and, and maintained by F5 specifically for iWorkflow. So there's loads of documentation out there on how to do that. But if you've developed iApps yourself internally or, or someone in your organization or team has, then you need to speak with them and find out you know, what, what that mapping should look like um, when you provide the response to the application tier when you create new iApps. So that was all we had for today. Again, I'm going to provide all the links after I've posted this video. Um, hopefully that was useful to you. Thanks for listening. We make apps go. F5.